Test, test. Got it.
Mic check, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You getting something there, Adam? One, two, three, one, two, three. Good, two channels? Okay, excellent.
Just uh, a point, we have two votes on the floor, regrettably, that just were called. Uh, all the other members have gone over to vote, so we will postpone to about 225, 2.30 at the latest, I hope. Uh, 15 minute vote followed by five minute, but as soon as the 15 minute one's over, we'll all shoot right back. So I apologize for that, for that delay, especially the Joseph, I know it's gotta catch a plane. So um, we'll start momentarily.
Mic check, one, two, three, four, five. Check, 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 one, two, one, two. Excellent. Okay.
Subcommittee will come to order, and let me begin by again expressing my apology for that lateness of our start. We did have two hearing, two uh, uh, votes, recorded votes, and they just went longer than anyone could have anticipated. For weeks this spring, the world watched as Miriam Ibrahim, a pregnant Christian woman in Sudan, faced flogging and the death penalty because her work government would not accept that she had lived her life as a Christian and married a Christian man. Miriam has demonstrated both courage and grace under pressure, giving birth in jail in May, while chained and caring, caring for her two children, including her newborn, not only under restraints, but without the normal amenities that any pregnant woman and nursing mother should expect. The harsh application of Sharia law on non-Muslims was the trigger, and everyone knows this, for the two-decade-long civil war in Sudan that eventually led to the secession of the South. Sudan is one of 20 countries in the world who have laws against apostasy, defined as the abandonment by an individual of their original religion. In Sudan, apostasy is effectively considered leaving the Muslim faith, particularly the interpretation of Islam followed by authorities there. In Sudan, to leave the Muslim faith is an automatic death sentence. If you are considered an apostate, you cannot legally marry someone of another faith and for this, Miriam was also charged with adultery and sentenced to flogging. However, this story is not just about harshly applied religious and legal principles in violation of national and international law. Daniel Wani, Miriam's husband, is a Christian who is a dual American and South Sudanese citizen. He has lived in the United States for more than a decade. He married Miriam in late 2011, and they had a son a year later. Somehow, the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum could not find a way to help bring this American to get his family out of Sudan before the crisis developed, even after she was arrested and released last year uh, on charges of involving apostasy. Today, today's hearing is intended to examine the facts as we know them and to determine how strictly applied rules almost led to the officially sanctioned beating and execution of a young woman who has lived as a Christian all of her life, but who has now been told that she has no right to choose her religious belief. This hearing was originally scheduled to take place in June, but at the urging of Sudanese officials and Mark Meadows, who has been doing yeoman's work on this issue, and some in our government, we postponed it to allow for quiet diplomacy to take place. However, Miriam's legal entanglements seem to be increasing now rather than diminishing. We intend for this hearing to be a strong appeal to the government of Sudan to use their legal authority to end the official entanglements Miriam has faced since her arrest in January and subsequent trial. A Sudanese court initially ruled that the mere fact that her father was Muslim means that she should have been raised as a Muslim. She was given three days to convert to Islam, but she told authorities she would not abandon her Christian faith. Her refusal to leave the faith she had practiced her entire life uh, led to her being in mortal fear for her life. Fortunately, a Sudanese appeals court believed that she uh, considered herself Christian and overturned her conviction on apostasy and adultery charges. However, members of her family, allegedly, have appealed the overturning of her conviction. Meanwhile, the government of Sudan rearrested Miriam for using South Sudanese documents in an attempt to leave the country, and while she was released on bail, that case is still pending. Finally, Miriam's family has filed a case in domestic law court to establish that she is Muslim and that her brother, who was unable to prove his legal connection in the original apostasy adultery case, uh, should be her legal guardian under Sharia law. The hearing date for at least part of that case is currently set for August 4th because she was not given a written summons to appear at a July 17th hearing on the matter. We cannot be absolutely certain of the exact chain of events that led to this situation. The Department of State understandably decided to, to not to testify at this particular hearing, although this will become a hearing in a series of hearings until this is resolved. Daniel and Miriam are still in Sudan at this point, and we will invite the State Department to give a full accounting uh, and any in insights they might want to provide. 
uh, Daniel and Miriam are still in Sudan, as we all know at this point. Daniel is free to leave with his children, but has chosen, of course, to stay with his wife until she, too, can leave with her family. Since Miriam's conviction in May, a bipartisan, bicameral congressional coalition has worked tirelessly to undo the harsh penalties for her under the apostasy and adultery laws and to secure her family's repatriation to the U.S. Contact was made with Daniel, as well as the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum and the Sudanese Embassy right here in Washington. Eventually, the headquarters uh, offices of both State Department and U.S. Citizenship um, and Immigration Services got involved. Yet one wonders why this matter had to come to a crisis stage before a means could be found to avoid what now seems to have been an inevitable outcome in this case. Daniel told congressional staff that he sought help from the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum, but was told that he should seek an attorney, since the situation was mostly focused on his wife, who was not an American. This was the advice he received even when he was arrest when arrested and had his passport seized. An American citizen should expect more, I believe, from his government's representatives in a foreign country when the country's government has taken action against them. Sudanese religious do not have the right to force someone to be Muslim when they assert their beliefs to be otherwise. Under the principles of natural law, which are the basis of our governing documents and those of countries around the world, there are certain inalienable rights endowed by our Creator. The decision on how to worship our Creator is one of them. Elements in Sudan's Islamic clergy and in the government interpret the Quran to give them license to tell people how they will live out their faith whether they consider themselves Muslim or not. In Miriam's case, her father had been absent from her life since she was a small child. Her Christian mother raised her as a Christian. Sadly, Miriam is not the only Sudanese who, has, who chose differently on the matter of faith, only to face, be faced with a death sentence for that choice. Sudanese activist Mahmoud Mohammed Taha was arrested and charged with apostasy in 1984 for his efforts to end Sharia law in Sudan. He was subsequently executed. In some countries, Christian converts have been forced to renounce their faith and conform to the version of Islam favored by the government of that day. Some of these countries have constitutions that ostensibly guarantee religious freedom, even as they may also have laws that actually contradict those rights. Except for Malaysia, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, the other 15 countries, including Sudan, have signed the International Covenant on civil and political rights guaranteeing freedoms for their citizens. Article 18 of that document enshrines, quote, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Speaking of the rights of the individual, that article also forbids coercion, which would impair this, his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. Article 18 also guarantees the freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice and freedom to either individually or in a community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. Close quote. quote. The current report by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom cites Sudan as a country of particular concern due to its governments engaging in systematic, ongoing, and egregious violations of freedom of religion. According to USERF, Sudan is the world's most violent abuser of the right to freedom of religion or belief. Thankfully, we have the author of that law, the International Religious Freedom Act, Frank Wolf, who back in 1998 authored that landmark legislation. And today, testifying, we have Zudi Jasser uh, from the uh, commission uh, who recommends in his testimony that not only should the U.S. government take appropriate actions against Sudan, as detailed in IRFA, but that our government should also make freedom of religion and human rights a centerpiece of U.S.-Sudan bilateral relationship, as that has not been the case to date. The troubling case of Miriam Ibrahim should warn of future incidents which, in which those who do not believe in Islam are defined by the government are persecuted or placed in fear of death or torture. We again appeal to the government of Sudan to use all legal means at its disposal to free her this courageous young woman and allow her uh, to pursue her faith and join her husband in the United States. I'd like to yield uh, to a friend and colleague, uh, the ranking member, Mrs. Best. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership and for convening today's hearing. I'd also like to thank our distinguished witnesses, and I look forward to hearing your perspective on the socio-political context in Sudan as it relates to this case, the legal framework, uh, as, well, as well as adultery laws and, inf and information on the limitations on religious, freeman, uh, religious freedom. As we prepare to hear from today's witnesses, I hope we can learn critical lessons from their experiences and use them to increase awareness and support for the improved protections of human rights and religious freedom in Sudan. I'm also interested in hearing an update on, on the case. Uh, I met not too long ago with uh, representatives from the embassy, and it's my understanding that uh, this case was going to be resolved very soon. So I will be interested to hear uh, your updates. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. Thank you uh, very much. I'd like to now yield to the uh, gentleman from the, on the committee, Mark Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each one of you for your valuable time in coming here. And I think uh, the fundamental question for all of us is, uh, is this a day where truly religious freedoms uh, of all faiths are going to be upheld and valued in America? And with that, uh, it is critical. History shows us. Uh, and it's not about just about Christian faith. It's of many faiths. History shows us that time and time again, when we don't value that, the outcome is, is tragic. And so I thank each one of you uh, for coming today to spend your valuable time to not only uh, continue to intercede on behalf of Miriam, but to also make it a reminder to those of us in a freedom-loving world that it is, it is critical that we stand on those foundations of upholding religious liberty. Uh, if there are policy issues that we can do to tie uh, our policies more towards valuing that, I, I look forward to hearing uh, from each of you on that particular subject. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, uh, Mr. Betters. I want to thank you for uh, the meetings that you arranged with the ambassador uh, in an attempt to try to do this as efficaciously as possible. Uh, and it, the meeting that you did convene was, I think, a very important one, but still uh, we have not, it has not yielded the result that we're all hoping and praying for. But thank you for that leadership. Mr. Pittenger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to participate and for holding this hearing of such a great importance. I commend you for your tireless dedication, as always. I've watched you now for the last 30 years, bringing the right of freedom of religion to everyone in the world. I'd also like to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today and for the dedication you've shown to defending human rights and religious freedoms, freedoms of conscience throughout the world. The case of Miriam Isham, Ishag is tragic, a story now, regrettably, that's being told throughout the world. She, a young woman in prison because she has chosen to be a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> her punishment for following her faith, for refusing to convert to a religion she does not believe in, death by hanging. The Sudanese government declared her marriage to a Christian man unlawful and therefore convicted her of adultery, punish punishable by 100 lashes. Thankfully, an appellate court overruled both of these convictions, but Ms. Ishag still is not free. While trying to leave Sudan with her husband and children, one which she gave birth to while she was in prison. The family was again detained on claims of using false travel documents. Here's a family simply trying to believe in their own convictions and live out their faith, trying to practice their own religion. And this is what they have been subjected to. While Ms. Ishak's case has garnered significant media attention, we must remember the denial of the basic human right to religious freedom is not an isolated case. As members of the United States Congress, it's vital that we continue to shine light on all the cases of injustice and for the United States to continue exerting whatever pressure we can on governments who so blatantly and obviously infringe upon those rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do yield back. Mr. Pittenger, thank you very much for your comments and your leadership. We now uh, yield to uh, Chairman Frank Wolf, and again, he is the author of the International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, landmark legislation that finally, at long last, in 1998, put religious freedom uh, at, at, as a core element of our U.S. foreign policy. Chairman Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for having the hearing. I think, as Mr. Pittenger said, you've probably done more than anybody else in the time that I, I have served here. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the witnesses 
I, I think there are two points. I think our State Department is failing us. We've seen their lack of action on people in Korea. We've seen their lack of action with regard to people in Vietnam. We've seen the lack of action, not even to visit uh, Lee Jalbo's house in China when he is the Nobel Prize winner and his wife is not well. And we see the, the fundamental weakness. And we've also seen the failure of this administration with Pastor, Pastor Abedini. I mean, Pastor Abedini is white. They're American citizens, and we can't even get them to do anything, nor will the secretary meet with them. So now this, this is not a so surprise. Secondly, I think I just separate myself out from the State Department. Weakness is never good. Weaknesses, and we are weak. We are perceived as weak. Now, I say somewhere out there, and I can almost predict to, there's a representative or two of the Sudanese government. They're going to listen. They're going to send a message back to Bashir. Bashir is an indicted war criminal. Indicted war criminal. 2.1 million people died in the North-South battle. He has blood on his hands. So this ought to be a test. If Miriam is not out in two or three weeks, the word should go out. They will never be off the list. They will always be on the terrorist list. There will always be sanctions. We will bring the government down. But you cannot. What they're doing with the Nuba Mountains, what they're doing with regard to Darfur, they were responsible for the genocide in Darfur, and it still continues today. So they're going to look to see how strong you are. One of them out there, they may have a law firm working for them, too. We'll come back and tell them. If Miriam is not out in two weeks, never should they ever be taken off the sanction list. And we should make sure the U.N. tracks Bashir down when he goes to Egypt, wherever he goes, and bring him so he goes to Hague and stands as a criminal. And thank you for having the hearings. Uh, Chairman Wolf, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cotton. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Bass, for letting me join your committee today, first off. Second off, I would like to closely associate myself with the remarks of Frank Wolf, a great champion in the United States Congress for re religious liberty. It's a travesty that Miriam was detained at all in Sudan or that her detain detention has continued. Uh, I agree with Mr. Wolf, she should be released post haste, uh, if not in two weeks from now. Uh, but it is troubling that this is part of a pattern more broadly throughout the Middle East and North Africa and, and regrettably all around the world. Uh, Twenty countries now have laws penalizing apostasy and eight of those can legally impose the death penalty for apostasy for nothing more than being a follower of Jesus Christ. I saw this kind of persecution firsthand when I was a lieutenant with the 101st Airborne in Iraq and Baghdad in 2006, Christian churches being vandalized and Christians being persecuted and driven out of their homes and neighborhoods. We see it again today in Mosul as the Islamic State is driving Christians out of that city where they have lived almost since the times of Jesus Christ. As a country that was founded by religious refugees and for whom religious freedom is our very first freedom. It is incumbent upon us in this institution, as well as the President and the State Department, to rectify the injustice, not just when it involves Americans like Pastor Abedini or Miriam and her family, but to the greatest extent we can all around the world. Thank you. Cotton, thank you so very much, and thank you for your extraordinary military service. I'd like to now introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we are very fortunate to have four very knowledgeable, eminent individuals uh, to provide testimony to the committee, beginning with Dr. Uh, Zudi Jasser, who is a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He is also the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Dr. Jasser is a first-generation American Muslim who, whose parents fled the oppressive Ba'athist regime of Syria. He earned his medical degree in the U.S. Navy on a U.S. Navy scholarship and served 11 years in the Navy. Jasser Jasser has testified before Congress before, including before our subcommittee, and has briefed members of the House and Senate frequently on issues related to religious freedom. Uh, we will then hear from the Honorable Tony Perkins, who is president of the Family Research Council. He is a former member of the Louisiana Legislature, where he served for eight years, and he is recognized as a legislative pioneer. Since joining FRC in the fall of 2003, he has launched new initiatives to affirm and defend the Judeo-Christian values upon which this nation was founded. Uh, Tony Perkins and FRC have led the way in defending religious freedom. He hosts a daily national radio program and broadcasts a daily commentary heard on over 300 stations nationwide. His daily email update is sent to tens of thousands of individuals uh, throughout this country and even the world. 
We'll then hear from the Honorable um, Ambassador Joseph, Grover Joseph Reese, who has served as the first United States Ambassador to East Timor and as Special Representative for Social Issues in the U.S. Department of State, where he was responsible for promoting human dignity, including issues affecting vulnerable persons uh, in the family within the U.N. system. He was also a senior staff member of this, uh, this committee. Matter of fact, he was general counsel and staff director, where he was responsible for human rights and refugee protection, and played a major role in drafting and enactment of important human rights legislation, including uh, the TP, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, IRFA, Torture Victims Relief Act, uh, of, of high significance as well. He served as general counsel of the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service and uh, was extremely knowledgeable, especially in fighting uh, against the forced repatriation of many, including uh, the Vietnamese boat people. Uh, as a direct result of his work, uh, some 20,000 Vietnamese who were sent back uh, were brought to this country, were re-reviewed uh, when they were improperly screened out as refugees. Uh, so I want to publicly acknowledge the extraordinary work that he did uh, to ensure the safe um, uh, repatri not repatriation, but immigration of those people, uh, those Vietnamese boat people to the United States. And finally, we will hear from Mr. Omar Ishmael, who was born in the Darfur region of Sudan and spent over 20 years working both independently and with international organizations on relief efforts and human rights. He fled Sudan in 1989 as a result of his political views and helped found the Sudan Democratic Forum, a think tank of Sudanese intellectuals working for the advancement of democracy in Sudan. In addition, he co-founded the Darfur Peace and Development Organization to raise awareness about the crisis in this troubled region. He currently works as policy advisor to several agencies working uh, in crisis management and conflict resolution in Africa. Thank you as well for your leadership and for being here. I'd like to, be, would like to begin with Dr. Jesser. Thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Bass and uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this uh, extremely troubling case of Miriam Ibrahim. I ask, my, that written, I ask that my written testimony be submitted for the record. Without objection, it's a order. Miriam Ibrahim's case must must continue to draw international attention until she and her family leave Sudan for freedom in the United States. Even then, the international community must continue to focus on Sudan because while Miriam's case is among the most egregious, it is only the latest example of the Sudanese government's deplorable religious freedom and human rights record. It's simply the tip of the iceberg, as we've heard from many of your comments. This record has earned Sudan a country of particular concern, CPC designation since 1999 from not only our commission but also from the State Department. The government imposes a restrictive interpretation of Sharia law on Muslims and non-Muslims alike and charges individuals with the capital crime of apostasy, flogging the Sudanese for undefined acts of indecency and immorality, arrests, threatens, harasses, discriminates against Christians and other minority views. These religious freedom violations along with the violence in Southern Kordofan, Blue Nile, Darfur, derived from President al-Bashir's policy of Islamization and Arabization. Miriam's ordeal began with her February 17 arrest. And at that time, here's a picture of her from before her arrest. At that time, her brother reported to the police that she had left Islam to marry a Christian man, a capital crime in Sudan. The Sudanese government's application of Sharia law prohibits a Muslim woman from marrying a Christian man. However, while Miriam was born to a Muslim father and an Ethiopian Orthodox mother, her father left the family and she was six, when she was six, and she was essentially raised a Christian. Miriam was convicted on May 15 of apostasy and sentenced to death by hanging. Because the court did not recognize her marriage, she was also found guilty of adultery and sentenced to 100 lashes. While imprisoned, Miriam gave birth to, on May 27 to her baby daughter, who was detained with her and her two-year-old son. On June 23, an appeals court canceled the apostasy charges and death sentence, most likely due to the international attention that many of you and others have brought, and ordered her release from prison. She and her family then were detained on June 24th, a day later, at Khartoum's airport, and they sought to leave the country. 
after which she was held with her family at a police station and then arrested again on document fraud charges. Since June 27, she and her family now remain in Sudan safely as Sudan, as the Sudanese government continues to block their departure from the country. On, June, on July 17, Miriam's brother, alleged brother, challenged the appeal that had overturned her apostasy and adultery convictions. The Sudanese Supreme Court has up to three months to review the brother's court action, and that's her current status. Miriam's ordeal reflects more deeply the Sudanese government's enforcement of a rigid ideology against Sudan's religiously diverse population, particularly non-conforming Muslims and Christians. As detailed in uh, our commission's uh, November 13 policy brief, which we have available in the back, um, I request that that also be submitted for the record. Uh, without objection, it will be made a part. Thank you. Record. The Sudanese government has implemented Sharia law for more than 30 years, with the 1991 Criminal Code Act being the cornerstone of that implementation. The act addresses offenses that violate public order and carry the death sentence for apostasy, stoning for adultery, prison sentences for blasphemy, and floggings for undefined offenses of honor, reputation, and public morality. Since 2011, there have been an alarming increase in the number of persons arrested and found guilty of what are called hadood offenses, with the most dramatic increase in the number of those, such as Miriam, arrested for apostasy, carrying an automatic death sentence. For example, in the past three years alone, more than 170 persons have been arrested, the majority of whom practice a version of Islam, which differs from that of the ruling National Congress Party of Bashir. Government pressure on Christians in Sudan has also increased since South Sudan's 2011 independence, with the government announcing in July that it no longer would issue any permits, this is just a few weeks ago, for a new church building. In the last several years, at least 11 churches have been attacked and others threatened. Individual Christians have also been arrested, threatened, and harassed in Nuba, and South Sudanese Christians continue to be arrested and deported. The Sudanese government also discriminates against its minority Christian community for, by promoting conversion openly to Islam, prohibiting foreign church officials from traveling outside Khartoum, using school textbooks that negatively stereotype non-Muslims, and giving preferential treatment to Muslims in employment and services, and in court cases involving Muslims against non-Muslims. So what can we do? Miriam's case underscores the need for the U.S. government to do the following. First, we need to continue to advocate tirelessly for Miriam and her family to immediately leave Sudan and that all charges against her be dropped and all prisoners who have been jailed on account of their religion or belief also be released and the charges against them be dropped. Second, we need to redesignate Sudan as CPC and take appropriate actions that follow thereof. We also need to make religious freedom and human rights a centerpiece of the U.S.-Sudan bilateral relations and take the conversation beyond simply being the issue of violence. We need to press the Sudanese government to engage in an inclusive and transparent constitution drafting convention. We also need, before, before normalizing relations or lifting sanctions, require that the Sudanese government abide by international standards of freedom of religion and belief. And we must also support all those civil society groups monitoring the implementation of the public order laws and advocate for their immediate repeal. We must hold the Sudanese government accountable to protect and respect freedom of religion or belief, not only for Mariam Ibrahim, but for all Sudanese. Thank you. Dr. Jasser, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the Honorable Tony Perkins. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Bass, and uh, members of the committee. I want to thank you for not only the opportunity to address the situation of Miriam Ibrahim, but also for uh, the work that this committee has done on religious liberty around the world. And with that, I want to uh, briefly address the broader issue of religious liberty uh, internationally. I'd like, to, I'd like to address the why and the how. Uh, first is the why. Uh, now, I, I'm here, as many of us tracked the, uh, the media reports that have been out there, some accurate, some not. I've worked with members of this committee, other members of Congress, and I've also engaged in conversations, ongoing conversations, Sudanese officials. The why we're here, I think, is very clear. We're here because of the courage of a 27-year-old mother. A 27-year-old mother, if you'll just for a moment 
imagine the situation in a prison in Khartoum, which the UN says has an infant mortality rate of one child a day dying in that prison. At her side, eight months pregnant, is a 20-month-old boy. And she has told that if she will denounce her faith in Jesus Christ, there's the door, you can be a free person. But yet she refused to denounce her faith because she had the courage to stare death in the faith in the face. What has America done? Where is the courage in America to speak out for those who are suffering at the hands of dictators who refuse to recognize not an American right, but a human right, a human right of religious freedom to determine the destiny of one's own life, to live your life according to your own conviction and your faith. Why the silence in America? Now, you might be tempted to say, well, this is just one case. Why the big deal? This is not an isolated case, as Dr. Yasser said. But just in April, another individual who her attorney, the attorneys have asked that the name not be used, was detained under the same charges of apostasy and facing the same possible outcome. We also have to consider Daniel, her husband, American husband that's been referenced here, a man who was bound to a wheelchair, who was powerless to do anything to secure the freedom of his wife and his children, and yet he went to the State Department waiting for them to act on behalf of his children and his wife, and there was silence until just recently. Now, while other governments have called attention to Miriam's situation, including the European Parliament, passing a resolution, and the British government's prime minister speaking publicly, as I said, the U.S. government has been practically mute, even after multiple activist organizations initiated petitions with hundreds of thousands of signatures. The U.S. government's disinterest in the plight of an American and his family is simply indefensible. And of course, we do this ignoring the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, which states that, quote, it shall be the policy of the United States to condemn violations of religious freedom and to promote and to assist other governments in the promotion of the fundamental right to freedom of religion. The United States has clearly failed to adequately condemn this violation or to speak out clearly and with conviction and courage on behalf of Miriam. A religious freedom is increasingly under attack around the world today. According to Pew Research Center, as of 2012, Christians continue to be harassed in more countries than those of any other faith, Muslims not far behind. Religious freedom is a fundamental inherent in international human right. Now, yes, it is a core American ideal, an ideal that we should defend at home and abroad. And a warning should be sounded across America that an indifference to religious persecution abroad can only lead to greater religious intolerance here at home. Now, the binding International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which has been referenced, the ICCPR, explicitly states everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, this right shall include freedom to have or to adopt a religion or a belief of his choice and freedom, either individually or in community with others in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching, end quote. And that's binding. U.S. In inaction overseas is all the more troubling when U.S. citizens are involved, as has been referenced, such as Daniel Wani, Pastor Saeed Abedini, detained in Iran, and Kenneth Bay in North Korea. And I want to point out the U.S. indifference to religious hostility is not limited by political party. It was under the George W. Bush administration's allowance of blasphemy laws under the new Afghan constitution that almost led to the execution of Abdul Rahman, a Muslim convert to Christianity who only escaped with the assistance of the UN when he was offered asylum in Italy. It is difficult to look at these facts and not understand them in light of the current administration's unilateral reinterpretation of religious freedom domestically. 
This administration believes religious beliefs should be quarantined to private spaces and excluded from the public space. This truncated view of religious freedom domestically, more accurately described as the freedom of worship, is matched by its, the administration's failure to even address the growing threats to religious freedom internationally. Indeed, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry only commented on Miriam Ibrahim's case after international outcry over her plight made it impossible for them to remain silent. Now, there's more for a reason that more reasons for we should be involved and concerned about religious freedom. There's a growing body of research that points to nations that protect religious freedom as nations have freer econo economic markets and therefore greater economic stability and prosperity. This religious intolerance as evidenced in Sudan must be condemned in its own right. Yet such intolerance is also harmful because it stifles economic growth in countries that needs economic growth greatly. In turn, the lack of economic growth fosters instability and a lack of security. There's the why. What's the how? Religious freedom should be a central priority in U.S. diplomatic and strategic engagement worldwide in order to promote freedom for its own sake as well as for reasons of global stability and security. The U.S. and this committee must seriously consider making human rights and religious freedom a central component of U.S. international aid contributions. In short, promoting religious freedom promotes societal well-being at home and abroad. We must, in this particular case, the administration should specifically work to ensure Miriam's children are immediately granted U.S. citizenship as all the proper documents have been submitted. Continue to provide Miriam and her family physical protection while they're in Sudan. Their lives are at risk. Provide Miriam and her family the proper medical care. There's reports that uh, the, the child, Maya, was uh, injured at birth. We need to make sure that they have the proper medical care. And then we must pressure the Sudanese government to ensure the legal proceedings conclude quickly, as in yesterday. And then, secondly, we must urge Congress to pass H.R. 601, the Trent Franks bill that condemns the treatment of Miriam Ibrahim and pressures the administration to act in accordance with the United States' responsibility to be a strong advocate for religious freedom generally and Miriam specifically. It was Miriam's courage that brought us here today. Now it is our turn to act with courage to bring Miriam and her family to America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Perkins, for your testimony. Ambassador Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify at this timely and important hearing. And I'm very honored to be on uh, a panel with these extremely distinguished and, and dedicated witnesses. Thank you. I've been asked to testify on a narrow question about the citizenship of the two children, whether the two children of Miriam Ibrahim and Daniel Wani are United States citizens who should be given appropriate documentation of their citizenship and who should be afforded such protection and assistance as the government of the United States typically gives its citizens who are residing and visiting in other countries. Now, United States citizenship uh, law with respect to children born overseas to a United States citizen is fairly straightforward. Section 301 uh, of the Immigration and, Nationali uh, and, Nationaliz pardon me, and Nationality Act uh, provides in pertinent part that when a child is born outside the United States and its possessions to uh, two parents, one of whom is a United States citizen, the other of whom is a foreign national. The child is a citizen at birth, provided that the U.S. citizen parent has lived in the United States for at least five years before the birth, and that uh, two of those years were after the parent had reached the age of 14. Looking at the facts of the case, which have been set forth by other witnesses, uh, and lining them up against the law, it seems pretty clear that these two children are United States citizens and should be certified as such. Uh, the two parents were married at the time of both births. 
Uh, Mr. Wani is listed on the birth certificate of Martin, the oldest child, as the father. There is, as yet, I understand, no birth certificate for Maya, who was born uh, while her mother was in prison. Uh, but there's no reason to think that anyone else will be put as the uh, will, will be listed as the father on that birth certificate. Um, the uh, it would seem that the application for uh, a certificate of citizenship or for a report of consular uh, birth overseas should have been granted, and yet Mr. Wani says it wasn't. Uh, importantly. By the way, Section 309 of the Immigration and Nationality Act sets forth some additional requirements for children born out of wedlock. If uh, the parents are not married at the time of the birth, uh, there has to be a clear and convincing evidence of the blood relationship between the child and the United States citizen parent. Importantly, that provision does not apply to children who were born uh, of, of a marriage of the parents. And uh, yet Mr. Wani says that he's been asked to provide a DNA test. So what it looks like is that the State Department is applying the test, the consular officer in question is applying the test that the statute provides for out of wedlock births uh, instead of the one that's provided for children born in marriage. Now some supporters of Mrs. Ibrahim have said that this must mean that our government is applying Sharia law to the case uh, because if the law is, if the marriage is not recognized under Sudanese law then they're not married and he, uh, he would have to meet the test uh, of blood relationship by clear and convincing evidence and perhaps a DNA test would be appropriate. Uh, I can't say that's not what the consular officer was thinking, I, I don't know, but I think that Unfortunately, this may be indicative of a broader attitude, a broader culture of negativity and denial that many of us who work in the immigration and citizenship area have encountered, not only in this case, not only in cases uh, involving Sudan or involving Christians, but in, but in cases across the board and around the world. Uh, I am an alumnus of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and I worked with many fine and conscientious people. But we often had to confront this idea that our job was to turn everybody down and then somebody would straighten it out later on if we were wrong. Uh, I later learned working with the, uh, I used to say we either needed to change our attitude or we needed to change the sign on the door to say anti-immigration and naturalization service. And I later learned working for the State Department and working for this committee that that uh, culture of denial is even more robust, unfortunately, in the consular corps than in the immigration uh, service. This doesn't happen because consular officers or immigration officers are bad people. Most of them are fine and decent and conscientious people. Uh, it happens partly because they really do encounter fraud. They really do encounter frivolous applications. And we all know the adage, once bitten, twice shy. I think a corollary of that is that if you're bitten four or five times, you're probably shy for the rest of your life. Consular officers also work typically in, uh, a lot of what they do involves non-immigrant visas. And for non-immigrant visas, tour, tourist visas, visitor visas, the law says that you are presumed to be an intending immigrant. That is, you are presumed to be lying until you can prove to the satisfaction of the officer that you uh, really will return to your home country uh, according to the terms of your visa. Now the problem is that a lot of consular officers seem to carry over that extreme skepticism, which is required by law in some cases, to cases where uh, the law doesn't require it, including the provision of documentation and other consular services to United States citizens. And I want to suggest, I've, I've, I've in my written testimony, which I hope will be accepted for the record, I've given some specific language in the Foreign Affairs Manual that seems to encourage consular officers in this attitude that somehow citizenship is a benefit that they're conferring and that they have discretion uh, and that they ought to do the same kind of investigation in a case involving uh, a married couple, a child of a married couple, as they would in an out-of-wedlock case under the statute. Uh, I do want to say that it's possible 
that the facts of the case, there could be facts known to the consular officer that would uh, justify requiring further evidence, not just the fact that the parents were married and that the father's on the birth certificate. Uh, and for instance, if Mr. Wani's passport showed that he hadn't been in Sudan at any relevant time uh, when the child could have been conceived, then it would be reasonable to ask for more evidence. That's not what Mr. Wani said happened. He says that from the very beginning when he approached the consular officer, he was told, I don't have time. He, was to uh, he said that the consular officer was rude and, and high-handed. Uh, if that happened, it was a violation of the law. When a consular officer denies a visa to somebody who's eligible for that visa, that might be bad policy. That might be a bad decision. But that's within the discretion of the consular officer. But citizenship is not a benefit. Uh, the consular officer isn't making you a citizen by giving you the certificate. You either are or you are not a citizen. And if a consular officer denies the appropriate documentation, the appropriate assistance and protection to a United States citizen, he or she is not just making bad policy, not just making a bad decision, uh, he's violating the law. Uh, I am happy to say that the State Department, and I'm proud of our government, that in the last few weeks, they seem to be making amends. Uh, they seem to be providing Mrs. Ibrahim and her family with uh, the appropriate attention and care and really working to solve this case. It's nice to know that first principles can sometimes trump institutional cultures and institutional concerns. In this case, the principle is that we Americans do not leave our own in harm's way. Thank you very much. Ambassador Reese, thank you very much. And without objection, uh, the additional information you'd like to make make a part of the record is so ordered. Mr. Ishmael. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Dambas, and Honorable Members. I'm honored to be here to appear before you to testify in this important case of Mariam Ibrahim, and I kindly request that my testimony be included in the record. Um, my testimony is going to focus on showing that this is not an isolated case. The case of Mariam Ibrahim is not an isolated case. It's a pattern of behavior that the government of Sudan had demonstrated through the years. 10 years ago, yesterday, the United States Congress determined that the violence that plagued the Darfur region of Sudan is a genocide perpetrated by the country's own government. The brutal Janjaweed militia that is recruited, armed, and financed by the government of Sudan rode through the villages terrorizing civilians, raping women, burning homes and markets, and destroying the livelihood of a great number of communities. That same tyrannical government is persecuting Miriam Ibrahim and sentenced her to death by hanging because of her religious convictions. The government of Sudan is the main perpetrator and culprit in the violence across Sudan that is visited on millions of Sudanese who this government considers enemies for no other reason than being different from the image it sponsors. This government flaunts a brand of Islam and promotes, and promotes a racial identity that is exclusive and divisive and met with widespread rejection and resistance among the majority of the Sudanese people. According to credible reports, Maryam Ibrahim was born to a Muslim father and a Christian mother, and she chose to be Christian. Maryam would not be considered a criminal in any democratic society that, that respects human rights because she would have the right to choose her religion and her life. The government of Sudan, however, not only ignores its citizen human rights, it disrespects its own constitution and the laws drawn from it. According to the Sudanese Interim National Constitution of 2005, and I quote, every person shall have the right to the freedom of religious creeds and worship, end quote. In practice, the government of Sudan does anything but adhere to its own contract with the Sudanese people. Shortly after the cession of the south of the country from the motherland became inevitable, President Bashir declared in Gadarif in Eastern Sudan in 2010 that Sudan would become a country, and I quote, with no racial or religious diversity. End quote. Successive events that took place 
thereafter proved that this statement was not a slip of a tongue, but a government policy that spares no one who opposes it. The issue of racial diversity was dealt with by continuing the, the raging war in the periphery that is in addition to Darfur, witness unprecedented, unprecedented violence in the Nuba Mountains and South Blue Nile in addition to callously crushing dissent in the urban centers by killing students in cold blood and committing widespread rape and torture. The violence had led to hundreds of thousands displaced in addition to refugees that have fled to the neighboring countries, including the rest of South Sudan. Food is used as a weapon of war and the fate of close to a million Muslims, Christians, and practitioners of indigenous religions and other faiths is in jeopardy. The genocidal regime in Khartoum was not satisfied with the social engineering that it ushered in to distort the ethnic composition of the country, but it coupled that with a no less lethal policy of religious intolerance. In April of 2012, an old church in the outer skirts of Khartoum was burned down to the ground by a mob of supporters of an Islamic cleric who is a member of the government-appointed Islamic Ulama Council. In addition, many Sudanese Christians complain about discrimination in getting jobs or in the workplace when they are employed, in addition to a general atmosphere of intimidation and intolerance. In academia, staunch fundamentalists were appointed to the faculty of the universities and devised syllabi to indoctrinate students, and they banned all opposing activities in the schools. Furthermore, the state of Khartoum issued a decree banning all building permits for new churches and Christian schools claiming that the capacity of the existing churches and schools is more than enough to serve Christian minority of 3% of the population. This figure was not supported by any census or any credible statistics. In the areas of the Nuba Mountains and South Blue Nile, mosques as well as churches and the limited number of hospitals are subject to indiscriminate bombing that is meant to scare civilians and drive them into the horrors of displacement. The government authorities and the security apparatus are used to harass people of different faiths, other than Islam, through in, in, intimidation and terror. The case of Maryam Ibrahim has backfired by making citizens more aware of the extent of the callous behavior that the government is willing to carry out in order to achieve its ob objective of remaining in power at any cost. Her case is also serving as a wake-up call to all peace-loving nations that this regime should be dealt with in a manner that will force it to alter its behavior. In conclusion, I respectfully ask this honorable institution, which represents the American people, to support the Madras Sudanese opposition that is working diligently for the democratization and the respect for human rights. The Sudanese Muslims and Christians and practitioners of other faiths deserve to live in peace among, them, among themselves and with other fellow human beings. History will look kindly at those who help them live in dignity and with the most sacred value of all, freedom. Thank you. Mr. Ishmael, thank you very much. Uh, my understanding, uh, Ambassador Reese, you will have to leave before. Uh, uh, my plane is running late, so I can leave a little bit after that. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just begin with a couple of opening questions and then yield to my colleagues. Uh, first, um, as you said, Ambassador Reese, in your statement uh, in a, a CNN interview dated May 30th, uh, an interview of Daniel Wani uh, by Nina Elbeger. Uh This is Mr. Wani speaking in response to a question. Sadly, it's not the U.S. government. When the problem began, uh, the U.S. consul here had a very negative position on this. She was very high-handed. She was very, very rude. She said, and I quote, I don't have the time. Um, if you could perhaps elaborate on this culture of denial that you mentioned earlier, because this has been a systemic problem that I and you, when you served as chief of staff for this committee, uh, in Congress now 34 years, it is all over the world we encounter this. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Tony Perkins mentioned Saeed Abedini. Uh, Saeed Abedini's wife, Makhmeh, was originally told there's nothing we can do. Frank Wolf convened a hearing of the Lantos Commission 
uh, and, and passionately called on the State Department and Secretary Curry, and then they said, well, we'll raise it, and, and Secretary Curry did issue a statement. When Mahmoud came here, she was still uh, bewildered by the lack of uh, engagement on the part of the U.S. government on behalf of this American being held by the Iranians, Iranians as we hold nuclear talks. Human rights fell off the, off, off the page, if you will. Chen Quan Jen, four hearings on this committee on Chen Quan Jen, um, and he was given back to the Chinese secret police under guard in a, quote, hospital uh, where he could not leave uh, with a unbelievably porous assurance uh, that um, Chen Quan Jen would be okay. That's what we were told. Thankfully, he testified through, by way of a phone call uh, and said, I want to come to America. And six hours later, that permission was granted. And we had more press here than I've ever seen before, and that helped his case. Uh, the situation in Tbilisi. I had a couple of my constituents stuck in Abkhazia as well as in South Ossetia. So I went there. And I found out to my shock and dismay that the Consul General uh, had said that, oh, this marriage, purported marriage, of an American who used to be a guard at the White House, so he had to be vetted quite, quite effectively, uh, and he was telling the truth, and this woman who was of Georgian uh, origin was bogus. And, and therefore, the little child who was in Abkhazia could not make, she was stuck uh, and literally was prostrated as Russian tanks went through her town. And obviously, everybody was scared to death something might happen to her. Uh, and then finally, Jacob Ostreicher. Uh, we've had several hearings on Jacob. He's finally out of, because of a private um, extradition effort uh, or uh, an effort to ferry him out of the country by way of an automobile. Um, at first, we were told, uh, and I was told this directly by the embassy and by top people at the State Department, that if he, at his request, I asked this question, if, if Jacob goes to the embassy, will he be uh, welcomed? Because he felt his life was in dire jeopardy. Uh, he even had, for a while, Venezuelan guards, uh, of all things, guarding him when he was in the hospital. They said, we will put him out the door. I made that phone call myself and heard that, and I said, are you kidding? An American? I mean, we're supposed to be the oasis. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, if you could speak to this culture uh, perhaps a little bit more, because I think there needs to be a sea change of attitude, which, again, the IRFA bill, Religious Freedom Bill, was supposed to do about religious freedom. Part of, the era, uh, part of that legislation had text in it about training foreign service officers to understand the importance and, and centrality of religious freedom, and that training has been very slight all these years. Uh, so. If you could answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think there are at least three things going on. One of them I've already spoken to, which is that you do get fraudulent applications, you do get frivolous applications. We're not supposed to grant those applications. And perhaps there's a natural human tendency when you've been uh, snookered a couple of times to, to assume that the snookering level is 99% uh, instead of uh, some lower number. Uh, and that is, that's just a, an occupational hazard of these kinds of jobs. A second, uh, but, but we've all seen people in customer service jobs, which is what this is, who frankly have live, outlived their usefulness on those jobs and ought to go find other jobs. And so uh, I, I think we do need to, to try to inoculate people against that tendency to deny good cases uh, simply because some cases are, are fraudulent. And that's particularly true where you're dealing with people who may well be American citizens. Uh, the second thing is, has to do with the institutional culture of the State Department itself, broader than just consular officers. The State Department is a foreign ministry. A foreign ministry's main job is to deal with the governments, with other foreign ministries, with governments of other countries. And these kinds of issues, these humanitarian issues, these human rights issues, these refugee issues, uh, they complicate what many uh, foreign service officers see as their main job, which is to improve the relationship between the United States and that other government. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're simplistic or, or one-dimensional. Everybody knows that we have to pay attention to those other issues, but I, I, I don't think that the, the, the natural reaction of somebody who has to go deal with the foreign ministry uh, in the country that he's living in every day, uh, when, he, when he hears about a Miriam Ibrahim case, he's not gonna say, oh boy, a chance to strike a blow for, for human freedom. Uh, he might understand that's his duty, we hope he does, but it's not something that makes the State Department's life easier. 
The third thing with these high profile cases where members of Congress get involved is, you know, I've seen it from both sides. So I've worked in Congress, I worked in the State Department. The executive branch in general and the State Department in particular hate to be told what to do by Congress. And so there's this, there's this uh, faux integrity that gets built up that we're not gonna be politically influenced. We're gonna do what we would have done anyway. Now, I don't wanna say that happens all the time. And I do have to say, as I said in my testimony, that there are many fine and decent and conscientious people in the State Department, that many of them do the right thing even if it hurts their career. But I do think that institutions have institutional cultures and that there are some of those tendencies that we need to fight. Yeah, before you, if you could answer that as well, but uh, you mentioned, um, Dr. Jasser, about no um, CPCs, uh, the fact that they have not been redesignated, and, and Robbie George, who was then the president or the chairman of uh, USERF, uh, and, and now Katrina Lantos Sweat has taken over that leadership as chairman. Um, no CPC since 2011, which I think is a huge abrogation of duty uh, on behalf of the administration. Uh, hopefully, they'll do it soon and do it robustly, including all those countries that need to be so named. But I think if you could speak to whether or not that sends a message uh, to countries that are committed egregious violations of religious freedom uh, when we don't even do the designations anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Smith, and that really was the follow-up to uh, Ambassador Reese's comments, is that, you know, we started a program on prisoners of conscience that various members have uh, adopted, if you will, uh, various prisoners across the spectrum in many different countries because these cases, like Miriam Ibrahim, are emblematic of deeper problems, typically, not only in Sudan, but in every one of these countries where prisoners of religious freedom, of conscience, of faith, uh, belief that are imprisoned simply because of their belief are a sign typically of a more systematic, egregious, and ongoing violations of uh, religious freedom and human rights uh, related to that. So as a result, that's why you make the connection between these prisoners and when we, when we defend them, when our president, when our State Department, our embassies defend these prisoners and say that we want them released and freed, it then sends a message that our, our freedoms that we defend at home and our uh, International Religious Freedom Act of 98 actually means something. And we've been concerned that uh, at the commission that there has been a stagnation and there's been no designations of CPC since 2011. The lists, uh, um, while there's no disparity on Sudan, we've uh, both the State Department and our commission agrees that they're a CPC. Uh, they have not redesignated them since 2011, and we hope uh, that when their report comes out, they follow that quickly with uh, uh, a designation as we have uh, recently in our report. Uh, so it's important that when these designations are made, it sends the message that we believe that there's egregious and ongoing violations, and as a result, it carries with it the sanctions that the law, uh, uh, the statute provides. And uh, I think that's how we translate the plight of people like the brave and courageous people like Miriam Ibrahim, then get translated into um, a process and policy that means that then religious freedom becomes a centerpiece. And most studies have shown recently, repeatedly, that countries that honor these principles then become more successful economically and more secure and less threats of terrorism and, and regionally become better actors in the world. So this is why I think it's very important that this be highlighted, and they have not done so. And we hope their report's supposed to be coming out this week. I think it's belayed, been delayed again, and hopefully it'll be followed by a redesignation of Sudan and other countries. I have some additional questions for Tony Perkins and Mr. Ishmael, but, and I'll go back to that in the second round. I'd like to yield to Ms. Banks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to get a sense from the, the panel how widespread they think apostasy is. Uh, in, in countries, one, where we are in conflict, in conflict with, but also in countries where we are allied. Uh, and if you could res respond to that. Any of the panelists, I'm not sure which one of you might know. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Bass. Um, the, you know, the issue of the implementation, as our report on uh, Sudan talks about, uh, typically what happens with countries that enact uh, more draconian forms of Sharia law, apostasy violations become a central part of that, as we saw in Afghanistan uh, and, and in Pakistan and in other countries in which the restriction 
upon the implementation of religious freedom is based upon one of the red flags for the government being that if somebody leaves his or her faith, and apostasy being one of those, but typically it's not isolated. We see the crimes of apostasy, if you look at Raif Bedawi in Saudi Arabia, uh, he's a Muslim who reports being a Muslim and yet he's in jail on the crime of apostasy because the version of Islam that he defended was not one in line with the Saudi government. So typically where you see uh, governments like Saudi Arabia or Iran or Sudan that implement draconian, more restrictive forms of Sharia. Apostasy is often one of the centerpieces, but linked to apostasy then are blasphemy laws that the government controls free speech with, and then crimes against uh, especially women, uh, controlling their ability for dress and expression and property. All of that follows the whole uh, implementation of Sharia, if you will. So do any of the panelists know I exactly what her situation is right now? I mean, I, I realize she's still uh, incarcerated, but um, uh, the embassy says that there is supposed to be a hearing. It's supposed to be an expedited process. Now, I heard that a few weeks ago. Obviously, it's not that much expedited, but I wanted to know if any of you had um, information on her exact status now. The information is uh, somewhat uh, well, it's not completely reliable. Uh, as the press reports report one thing, Sudanese officials say something else, and we often find the two are in conflict. Uh, but she is in a, uh, in a safe house, um, overseen oh, by... Oh, uh, is she under house arrest? Is that what it is? She's not under house arrest. She's actually under the watch care of the U.S. Embassy. Oh. And so she, she has been released from incarceration. When she was seeking to leave the country right. and detained, she was yep. detained for a few days in the police station, released, uh, they were, uh, had, a, had a bond, she was released, uh, and she has been released to the custody of uh, uh, the oversight of uh, U.S. officials. So she's safe at present, uh, as long as she stays where she's at. Uh, if she moves off of uh, the property where she's currently uh, residing, there's concern for Why her Why can't safety. she leave the country? I mean, I, I she, really... They have not issued her her documents in order her, for her, her to Sudanese leave. Her Sudanese passport? Correct. It, was been, it correct that she was detained because she had a South Sudanese passport? That is correct information based... Uh, that's correct based on the information we have. And do we know where she got that from? Why from the carrying... South Sudanese embassy. Um, uh, you with, look with like you want to respond. Mr. Rees looks like he wants to say something. Well... Uh, I don't, I'm not sure it was a passport. My oh, reading of the, I'm, I'm just reading the same news reports everyone else is. My reading is it was probably a travel document issued by the government of South Sudan because Mr. Wani, who's an American citizen, has dual citizenship with South Sudan. And we, the United States, issue travel documents to people who are not citizens. We issue them, for instance, to lawful permanent residents. And it was probably a document like that. So at, at this point, what do, do uh, you think any, again, any of the panelists, what do you think that we could do to be concrete and helpful in this situation now, as it stands now? I'm not talking about the broader picture, but just in terms of her and getting her out of the country. Mr. Ishmael? Thank you, Madam Ranking Member. I think um, the pressure should continue on the government of Sudan to release her because being there is not serving the purpose of any, anybody. And uh, uniting with her family and the place that she wants to, to travel to is a right of all Sudanese people. And, and she should exercise that right. Uh, and she should be given uh, what is called uh, an exit visa out of Sudan. And she is free to go to the destination of her choice. I think without that pressure, her situation is going to be in jeopardy. And we don't know, because the, the government of Sudan also is under pressure from some of the fundamentalist constituencies. Um, and, and, and I would say they brought it on themselves, because it would have been one of the many, many, many cases that are normal, everyday uh, people go to court, uh, but they made a political uh, issue out of it. And now they, it, it backfires. And um, the fundamentalist constituency of the government is pushing them, and they're saying you shouldn't release this woman uh, because this is a clear case of apostasy and we want to prosecute her. The government, I don't think they are interested, but also I believe there are some elements inside the government because the government is now really not in control of everything. I believe there are some elements inside the government want to get 
some mileage out of this. At the end of the day here, the United States will release this person to you. What is in it for us? And, and, and so it will become a, 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 a you know, kind of a, a, a kid pro quo and, uh, of some sort. So th that is also a possibility, but I think it is not serving the larger purpose of the bad rap that the government has got uh, uh, as a result of this case. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the ranking member. I thank each of you. I'm, I'm going to follow up with a few questions and would like uh, for you to comment on this. Uh, many people uh, at times think that the voice uh, to free people like Miriam and her family um, are just silent. There are just a few people. There's a few activists here or there. Uh, Mr. Perkins, would you say that, uh, could you comment on just what you're hearing from either your listeners or people that are contacting you uh, from the American people? Uh, can you give us a sense of what, what you're hearing? Congressman Meadows, I, I think the what we've actually seen internationally from Great Britain and how this was really a front page story uh, and leading to the prime minister making statements on it uh, is more reflective really of where the American public is on this issue. Uh, as uh, we've seen hundreds of thousands where there was a White House petition that uh, garnered over 50,000 people that uh, signed that in a very short window of time that are concerned about this. I think people recognize that there is a correlation between religious persecution abroad and the growing religious intolerance here at home. And I, and I also think that people realize that at at, there was a time when it meant something to be an American, that when you, were, you found yourself in trouble someplace in the world, that you were not alone. Unfortunately, what we're seeing increasingly is that if you're an American on foreign soil and you're held captive, you are alone. And I think that scares people. They want to return to where it, it meant something to be an American. And I, that is why I believe people are responding to this and saying Congress should do something. I know members of Congress have received lots of phone calls on this, and I know Congress is doing what they can. I, I express my uh, uh, public appreciation to you for the work that you've done on this particular case, but it is a broader symptom of a greater problem uh, with our country here today and our defense of religious freedom. Uh, so, Mr. Ambassador, uh, your comment earlier that the State Department does not want to um, have Congress telling them what to do. How can we encourage them? Uh, you know, they don't express that when they come before this committee for authorization or the Appropriations Committee for their budget. Uh, so I'm, I'm shocked to hear uh, this uh, kind of uh, information. But, but what can we do to work hand in glove with the State Department? They have a difficult job, obviously. Well, I, I, I think that recognizing a tendency, recognizing an institutional tendency uh, doesn't mean that you have to assume that forever after everybody who works for that other institution is your enemy. Uh, there are many people in the State Department who would be very sympathetic on this particular case, for instance. I think uh, there's one phrase that I remember. I've never heard it before or since, but I must have heard it 20, 30 times when I was working as a staff member for this committee uh, some years ago, and we'd be in negotiations with the State Department, and they'd complain that something on human rights or on refugees that went into a little too much detail, uh, they'd say, we know how to handle these cases. We don't have to be taught how to suck eggs. That was the, the favorite expression. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, and it always made me wonder, why would anybody want to learn how to suck eggs? Uh, but, but, uh, uh, but I think that um, uh, you need to reach out, as I know the committee has, uh, to the State Department on these issues and say, how can we help? Uh, but making clear that help includes an active uh, role in the process, an active concern uh, for the outcome. Uh, and, and you're right, there are many times when the State Department is very anxious for Congress to get involved, but of course the, we used to do the State Department authorization bill every two years, and the State Department's idea of a great authorization bill was, here's $13 billion, be good. Uh, whereas many members of Congress wanted paragraph after paragraph after paragraph about what to do in Haiti, uh, and about what to do in, in, in Sudan, what to do in Burma, and you need to reach a, a, a mean uh, between those extremes. 
All right, so Dr. Jasser, let me come to you. There are those within the Muslim countries who say that all we're trying to do is export our Christian faith. Um, and yet, I know in the case of Sudan, um, that, is, that is really not what this is about. Uh, my mother uh, went there 51 years ago, I believe, uh, uh, on a, a medical uh, uh, mission. Uh, I have friends who served in the Peace Corps, very dear friends who served in Khartoum in the Peace Corps. Uh, we have a number of, um, for many years, my family and my kids have uh, uh, sent money to uh, provide for relief for Sudan, uh, Sudanese uh, people that were in harm's way. How do we do a good job of elevating religious freedom and liberty uh, without it being one dimensional? Because uh, really when we look at religious liberty, uh, it, is, it is across uh, all faiths. And yet sometimes we put a priority on one faith or another in terms of what we will or will not tolerate. So how do, how do we do that? How do, how do we communicate that to a, a predominantly Muslim world in North Africa and the Middle East? Well, you know, I think, uh, Mr. Meadows, that's really a, uh, a wonderful question. And I, I think that's the wisdom of the IRFA Act, is that it's about religious liberty for all the citizens in the countries that we review and, and decide their CPC status on. And if you look at the citizens for every, uh, as much as often the the, the religious freedom uh, limitations for minorities can be a touch point of the conversation. One of the things our commission always talks about is the fact that within the majority there are those in those countries, Sunnis for example, I as a Sunni Muslim know that uh, uh, those who have a minority viewpoint within a majority population are also as persecuted if not more than the minorities and, and I think I would ask anyone to review not only the work of our commission but of the implementation of the IRFA Act abroad in countries to see that it's not specifically related to Christian minorities, but really related to any prisoners of conscience that have wanted to express their particular practice of faith different and have been arrested for it or uh, have suffered because of those expressions. And I think that's really what we've been expressing. It's not been about advancing or protecting Christianity. I, I know that as a Muslim. Um, but it's been about advancing and protecting liberty. And that's when those countries are more secure. Uh, there is no wisdom in believing that protecting only minorities um, protects a country's security. It's about protecting freedom for all of its citizens. And that's the wisdom of the International Religious Freedom Act. And we hope, you know, that an ambassador is named soon uh, for religious freedom that can begin to uh, advance these ideas. Uh, that, that spot has been vacant for some time. And I think this would allow the world to see that America is not just about protecting our own rights, but protecting every citizen and their right to free practice of faith. Um, or no faith. Right. Mr. Perkins, uh, you made a, a comment on your opening statements where you said that we're here because someone that was 27 years of age had the courage to stand up for their faith. Um, that cut deep to uh, my heart because in a similar situation, knowing that my kids were in a prison, knowing that a simple word would release them, uh, I don't know that I would have had as much courage. And, uh, and so it was very convicting. I think the other part of that, though, is if a voice of a 27-year-old woman, mother, that I've never met, uh, I've only seen pictures, can cause us to come together and cause us to start to understand that religious freedom is not only paramount, but it is foundational for who we are as a nation. What would you say to the millions and millions of Americans uh, that are out there that many times allow us each and every day to make small concessions? Each and every day, we sometimes look the other way. When something is said, something is done, 
we said, well, it, that's just the way things are. But yet they continue to get worse if we're not willing to stand up as this brave uh, young mother has so uh, eloquently articulated. What would you say to them? What do we need to do as a nation? Well, Congressman Meadows, I, I think just looking at this table is a reflection that is unique to America and our understanding of religious freedom. To my right, a Muslim. To my left, a Muslim and a Catholic, a Protestant, evangelical. And we're here for the same reason. We're here not in conflict, but we're in here in concert. Uh, we're not here working against one another, but we're working together for someone that none of us have ever met, uh, as you pointed out. It's a principle. It's a foundational principle through which I would say, as uh, former late, the late Harvard professor Samuel Huntington pointed out, that America became an economic powerhouse in part because of its religi religious ethic that provided for the ability for us to be successful as a nation. So that silence on behalf of whether it's Miriam and that growing persecution abroad, I mean, as we see what's happening in Iraq as it's becoming an Islamic state and Christians are being told that either uh, they leave, convert to to Islam or they pay a impoverishing tax or they die, that should be a concern for us as Americans. In fact, in our historical record, it has been a concern because this indifference abroad will lead to greater religious hostility at home, which ultimately affects the well-being and pros the prosperity of our society as a whole. So I, I believe we must advocate for individuals like Miriam this, and as has been pointed out, there's many more like her. But this is one we know about. This is one we cannot escape. We have no excuse not to help this mother and her family. Well, I want to thank you uh, and your work as the American people have reached out. You have been uh, daily, hourly, minute by minute, uh, advocating on behalf of Miriam in religious freedom, and I want to thank you uh, uh, personally, but also on behalf of our nation for speaking up for someone who does not have a voice, because the silence that so often is deafening uh, cannot be something that we we tolerate. So I want to want to thank you, uh, one of uh, Mr. Ishmael. Let me come to you. You said something earlier that said that your belief is the Sudanese uh, government is they're wanting something from this. Um, uh, you know, what basis? Why would you why would you say that? So you're saying is the release would be predicated on Congress giving them something? Some um, uh, is just a speculation from on my side that s some of the elements inside the government might see this as an opportunity uh, to gain something from the United States. This government is desperate to get recognition, especially from the United States, because this is the country that is using all kinds of sanctions against it. This is the country that designated this government to be a sponsor of terrorism. This is the country that is supporting international law in the sense that uh, uh, President Bashir has been indicted by the International Criminal Court and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, and this is the country where we have a testimony like this from all these uh, uh, wonderful people who are trying to support this woman in need. And, and, and in this support, I don't see the support to Maryam uh, Ibrahim only. There are a million Maryam Ibrahims in Sudan that are Christians, that are Muslims, that are practitioners of other uh, faiths that were persecuted daily. The women that were uh, uh, sentenced to 40 lashes or 50 lashes because they were wearing pants, the women that were without any kind of uh, respect to the decency of, of, of human beings were considered indecent in, in, in public. And, 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 and they were, were faced with all kinds of, of threats and harassment. Uh, this is a case where the government of Sudan is trying to see if they can, or, or at least some elements there, to see that, well, if we do this, what, what is in it for us? We've seen 
from Naivasha and, and even before that, when the negotiations for the peace agreement, the negotiations to the secession of, the, of South Sudan, this government is always demanding something. They create obstacles so that when they come and they release these obstacles, somebody will say, oh, they did this, they are good, so let us reward them. And they do just enough to get this monkey off their back, and that is called the international community. And they are not sincere in going the extra mile to make sure that they, they, they do this in good faith. Every single step that they have done, be it negotiation with the, with the rebels, be it you know, letting the South go as they, uh, they boast, it, it wasn't because of them. It is because of the will of the people of South Sudan that they succeeded that country. So the, 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 the government is willing to do everything, including incarcerating people by, or, or detaining them by force or put them in house arrest so that they can gain something out of this. Well, let me uh, comment on that because uh, I'm, we met with uh, some of the Sudanese officials in, uh, here in Washington, D.C., as I know Mr. Perkins has, and uh, the relationship uh, is one that I think any relationship has to be built on mutual trust and respect. But negotiating uh, for Miriam's release with financial or other concessions is not something that is on the table. I think we've made that very clear. Uh, but I am hopeful that if there is a new, new day in Sudan, that this can be the start. And it may be very embryonic, but it could be the start of perhaps uh, a new relationship built on where religious freedoms are not only held up, but a relationship that, that is, uh, to both countries, mutual benefit. But to negotiate, uh, because there is um, a woman in prison or being held or thousands of others uh, for small incremental changes is not what this is about. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I want to come back to you uh, before your plane. You know, the, this is the only time I've ever heard of applauding a delayed plane, uh, but uh, I thank you for uh, bearing with us. How can we better? You know, you said that uh, the State Department likes for us to say, okay, here's $13 billion, go do with it what you will and do a good job. How can we encourage them that addressing situations like Miriam? will foster more of an open, uh, non-earmark, non-directive way in terms of finances uh, going forward. Because if, if they are truly standing up for the Miriams or the Saeed Abedinis or whomever it may be, I'm more willing to look at it and say, well, we don't have to, we don't have to put parameters. How do we do a better job of working with the State Department uh, where they can see the, the will of the American people? Well. It's, it's a very big conversation, and it's a conversation that's been going on for a long time. I remember Senator Helms, when he was chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, used to say they needed an America desk at the State Department. And uh, Secretary Albright responded by saying, the America desk is me. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and I, I believe that you need to keep on doing what you're doing. You need to keep on having hearings like this. I assume the State Department was invited to this hearing. Uh, maybe if you uh, have another one, uh, they'll, they'll uh, come and have something to say at the appropriate time. I think you need to, uh, I, I think it's okay for Congress to legislate on, on foreign affairs matters. Uh, I, I, there are some in the executive branch who thinks that's, think that's unconstitutional. Uh, I don't think it's unconstitutional. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, the executive branch's job is to execute, uh, Congress's job is to, to make policy, the International Religious Freedom Act, uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, these are examples of cases where the State Department resisted both of those bills. Uh, and, and it wasn't that they said they didn't agree with the objectives, they did agree with the objectives, but they didn't think they needed a legal framework in which to operate. Uh, trafficking, at least, uh, once, the, once it became law, the department has taken that issue to its bosom. They really do the job. They really do the reports well. Uh, international religious freedom, I think, uh, uh, sometimes they, they do well, but it's taken them a little more time to get used to, to uh, that idea. But uh, 
Uh, you change the, the legislative landscape, gradually uh, people will begin to, to get used to it and, and sometimes even to like it. Well, I'm going to yield uh, to my good friend and the chairman of the committee, and I'm going to yield not only the mic, but his chair no, back no, to stay, it. Stay, stay put, stay put, stay put. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your advocacy, because it has been extraordinary. Uh, I want the record to show that Mark Meadows has been absolutely relentless in pushing all of us. It didn't take much push for a few of us, but certainly um, <clears throat> made it very clear that this was one of the, if not the highest priority, so I want to thank him for his leadership. I want to thank our distinguished witnesses again for uh, your testimonies, which were very comprehensive and I think extraordinarily incisive. Um, you know, human rights usually uh, is demoted in U.S. foreign policy. That's been my experience. I've probably chaired some 500 hearings over the years on human rights, uh, and I've, it's never ceased to amaze me how uh, when it talks, it's usually page four if it's there uh, in terms of our priorities and somewhere at the bottom of page four, and that's not the way it ought to be. Uh, recently, we had a hearing on North Korea, and our former special envoy to Sudan, who is also co-chair of a North Korean human rights organization, said that when the six-party talks were, being, were still underway, he and so many others, including me, tried to make human rights a part of that, and it was excluded. So when those, when those um, talks imploded and nothing happened on the nuclear issue, we got even less when it came to human rights. Same goes with Iran. We have asked Secretary Kerry repeatedly to include human rights, um, and he has not done so. Uh, it's only the nuclear issue, and that's not going very well either. Um, if you could perhaps speak to the minimalist effort that I believe has been expended. I mean, the president, if he has time for golf and time for all the other things that he engages in um, that would be called recreational, pick up the phone and call some top leadership. Maybe he won't want to talk to Bashir. Uh, he is an indicted war criminal, and I met with him in the year 2005 with, with Greg Simpkins, and we had more of an argument than a conversation. Uh, but pick up the phone and see, we want these Americans to come back. Uh, that's not a heavy lift. Uh, and the same goes for the Secretary Curry and others to be in contact with them. What's your thought on that? It seems to me that they measure uh, the prioritization of an administration by how up the chain of command uh, they are admonished and even demanded of. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, Dr. Jasser. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, Chairman Smith, you know, I think from perspective of a uh, commission focused on religious liberty, one of the reasons of our existence is that uh, we hope to push the needle to emphasize the importance that uh, the focus, the current focus, regardless of what the motivation is, and I can't speak for uh, how the State Department chooses its uh, priorities, but, you know, if you look at the situation in Sudan, the, the violence that they've tried to address, which has been the centerpiece of their current focus, is trying to address the violence in places uh, uh, within the states of Southern Kordofan, Blue Nile, et cetera, it's failed. We, we've not done anything to address that. Why? Because one of the primary, if not the primary reason for that violence is the use of religious um, uh, repression and institutionalized mechanisms through Sharia law and other ways that have prevented religious freedom. And if that became, if religious liberty became a focus, we may then start to make some headways in an embryonic fashion with various cases like Miriam's and others that would begin to show that we're not only looking to stop the symptom, which is violence, but the causes, which is the lack of religious freedom and whatever tools, whether it be, you know, draconian Sharia law or uh, places like North Korea that are just repressive uh, uh, prisons of governments. Um, the bottom line is, is that the, the prevention of religious freedom, as we know in our history, is the first freedom for a reason. And, um, you know, I think that ultimately that needs to become a centerpiece of American foreign policy. And we think it'll then change and move the needle to decrease violence. And as we've seen, as uh, Mr. Perkins mentioned earlier, across the world, from Iraq with ISIS and, and, and other places, it's not a coincidence that religiously um, violent organizations are beginning to fill this vacuum, and that vacuum needs to be filled with something else, and it can only be filled with the idea of religious liberty, I believe, as a, as a step towards a solution. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the, the State Department has been busy um, aggressively pursuing its values and human rights priorities, which have not included religious liberty. Uh, they have been exerting pressure upon foreign governments to uh, abide by their values and their views, which are in large part uh, inconsistent with the majority of Americans. Um, and I think because of that, when we're talking about uh, pushing the uh, LGBT agenda on foreign governments and making that a priority at the State Department, religious liberty has suffered as a result. Uh, that has been a higher priority for this administration rather than a foundational principle uh, upon which this nation is rooted in. And as we've talked about, the economic success of other nations uh, have benefited from. So I think what we're creating by our negligence is greater world instability. Now, to verify that, all you have to do is pick up the newspaper, and the world is imploding. And what is this administration doing? Uh, scant little when it comes to these core value issues that guarantee the freedom and protection of not just American citizens, but the value of human life in general and this fundamental principle of religious liberty. I think the, I think the administration is very busy, but not about the people's business. Thank you. Ambassador Reese. Um, I do want to put in a good word for uh, some of the people who work on these issues in our government, including in the State Department. Uh, I said earlier that I think it took a while for the, the bureaucracy, if you will, to warm to this issue the way they did to trafficking. Trafficking very early after the passage of the act, which the State Department opposed, they, they decided to implement it and they implemented it vigorously. Uh, International Religious Freedom uh, Act, you could tell the first few years they weren't very, uh, they weren't very uh, uh, vigorous. And when I was in the State Department, I mean, a, a week didn't go by that we didn't get a memo telling us to do something, a cable telling us to do something about trafficking. We didn't get those about religious freedom nearly as often. Uh, I have sensed, I, I meet with uh, State Department officials, I, I do a lot of work on Southeast Asia, and I meet with both with the Regional Bureau and with the, the Human Rights Bureau, with the DRL, Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and with some other bureaus. And in recent years, I have sensed that the people in DRL, at least, uh, really do take these issues seriously. And they really do know more about chapter and verse of what's happening to, uh, to Montagnard Protestants in Vietnam and what's happening to Hua Hao uh, Buddhists in Vietnam than they did a few years ago. And so I think uh, the legislation is working, the, the work that, that you're doing, uh, Congress is doing to highlight these issues, the work that the Commission is doing. Uh, I don't know if the Commission's had the same experience, but I think there was real hostility to the Commission a few years ago uh, within the Department. I think there are still people in the regional bureaus in particular who, as I said earlier, see their job as, as having a good relationship with these other governments. And we all hear about knockdown, drag out battles within the department where uh, the Democracy Bureau, the, the ambassador for religious freedom, may recommend that a certain country be a CPC and the, the embassy in that country, the US embassy in that country and the regional bureau come back with everything they've got uh, and they manage to uh, defeat that. But that happens in trafficking as well. That's just one of the one of the realities of working in institutions is that they're not monolithic. Thank you, Chairman Smith. In my view, humbly, I would say uh, freedom is indivisible, and the people of Sudan, they don't have freedom, period. There is no freedom of speech. There is no freedom of assembly. There is no freedom to choose your religion. There is no freedom to choose anything. What we want in Sudan is that the rest of the world, including or spearheaded by the United States, helping us gain the freedom of the people of Sudan. Freedom, as it is, indivisible, freedom in everything. That is not available today. What we need to do with this government, this honorable institution, is to push the government of Sudan to change or else. We have to say with the loudest voice that this government needs to open up we need more democratization in Sudan. We need to give the freedom of the people of Sudan to choose their government, to choose 
what, whoever they want to represent them to choose the religion and, and to have absolute choice on everything. Without that, we are going, maybe pushing just for religious freedom or maybe for, for freedom of speech and the other freedoms will be curtailed and we have a freedom that is not complete. I think the people of Sudan deserve better. They deserve to live like the rest of, of people in the world with dignity and with respect to their rights. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ishmael, just ask you a question. It would seem to me that in any dictatorship or authoritarian government, there's always people, even within the government, who could be called reformers. Very often uh, they stay quiet for obvious reasons. Uh, we saw it after Tiananmen Square. There were a number of people, including in the People's Daily, uh, who showed themselves, they thought things were changing, and unfortunately when things didn't, uh, they found themselves in prison or in the Laogai uh, as a direct result. Um, I believe there's at least some tug of war going on in Khartoum between some people who would like reform and those who do not. Um, my hope is that if we start putting uh, clear lines of demarcation uh, and the international community and especially the U.S. government ratchets up significantly the importance. When I met with, with President Bashir, he spent most of his time talking about lifting the sanctions. And I said, that's not hard to do. Uh, there are conditionalities attached which have everything to do with respecting fundamental human rights and protecting the value and the dignity of life. Um, and uh, those sanctions are goner when that happens. Uh, we need to ratchet up, I think, and I think, uh, Mr. Perkins, your point about uh, other issues being, becoming prioritized, uh, frankly, I have been shocked and dismayed by how many ambassadors and foreign leaders have told me to my face uh, that the LBGT agenda is what trumps everything in the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, so religious freedom, in a way, is seen as an impediment um, to the advancement of that. And even the former head of the UNFPA, Dr. Sadek, when it came to the abortion issue, uh, said that the last remaining uh, barrier uh, to promoting the culture of death worldwide uh, was churches and synagogues and mosques uh, who believe in the sanctity of human life, including unborn children. Uh, so there's a tension, I think, within the State Department. Uh, I know that DRL has pushed that issue uh, to the exclusion of most everything else. And Secretary Clinton's statement to the Human Rights Council a couple of years ago uh, couldn't be more clear that that was the priority to the exclusion, I believe, of most everything else. So it's a very, very important issue because now we're seeing how it demonstrates on the ground uh, when a woman of faith uh, is neglected at least for several months, and I would say mistreated, uh, as well as her children and her husband. Uh, you know, as I think Ambassador Reese said, you know, uh, recently they're doing things that, that we all can be proud of, but at first there was, and, and why did that, why did it take a, a, an outcry by members of Congress, members of the U.S. Senate, religious freedom, NGOs, and others uh, to bring a focus upon this. It seems wrong to me uh, that it takes that kind of pressure just to do the right thing. So if you wanted to speak to any of that, and then I think you have some concluding remarks as well. Well, I want to thank the chairman for his words. We've, they've actually called votes. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left, but I want to, this is defining day. Uh, is, is a defining day for America. Are we willing to stand up and say enough is enough? And I thank each of you for being here today uh, to take time from your busy schedule. Uh, but it's also a defining day for Sudan. They have a choice to make, either uh, to make a decision that will hopefully provide a foundation for moving forward or to make another decision that could cause irreparable harm to the relationship going forward. And so uh, with that, uh, we, we pray for Miriam's uh, safe uh, arrival in the United States. And I thank each of you and we'll adjourn this committee.